Hello, my name is Scott Engel, and I'm with uh, Mercury Systems, and I'm in uh, 3D, actually, 3.5D, um, if, uh, if I keep eating and don't, uh, don't exercise a little more. Uh, I'm with Mercury Systems, uh, leading provider of secure and safe processing systems. And that's, in fact, what I want to talk about today is safety and security uh, coexisting. Now, little audience participation, do, does everybody recognize the characters I've used? Or does everybody not? So I made the tragic mistake of actually being done early with my presentation and ran this through marketing. Marketing full of millennials had no idea who Dudley Do-Right was. <laughs> they wanted to change it, but I told them, I don't know what Instagram is, so I don't care if you don't know who Dudley Do-Right is. So, so we're going with Dudley Do-Right and spy versus spy. So has anyone ever been in this meeting? where you have the security people and the safety people in the same, same room. It's difficult to get them into the same room, first of all. But I find myself being the gentleman in the middle trying to broker some sort of a meaningful discussion between these two groups. The safety people talk about it being too costly to implement security into a system. And the safety or security people say, hey, it's a closed technology. We can't discuss it. It's all classified. And so we're not going to we're not going to have a very meaningful conversation. The problem is they're both right and and they're both wrong. And in reality, for those of us who are actually using these some of these systems, we cannot afford to have a, a system that, even though it is safe, it is vulnerable to security threats. So I think it's time for enough uh, enough excuses. And Mercury is pushing very hard in order to bring these two groups to together and actually do something positive. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So a little bit, we've heard a lot about safety or security during the course of uh, the last couple of days. Let's talk a little bit about safety. Safety systems are generally systems that are uh, developed this very rigor, very rigorous requirements-driven uh, processes. We've all heard of DO-254 uh, and DO-178, but there are several industrials or automotive. There are medical specs that are, that are equivalent or, or share a lot of commonality. They follow a very uh, rigorous V-shaped diagram where we're defining high-level specs. Those specs or, or requirements are, are derived down into lower-level specifications. Code and, and circuitry is often, often developed from those low-level specs, and there's complete traceability uh, to that. Uh, that process involves a lot of verification and validation, and it generally produces correct results. Perfect results? No, typically not. Um, software, for example, for in, under DO-178, some of the best software that's probably ever been written is the software on the space shuttle, about 420,000 lines of, of software with about one defect. It's pretty good. Not very many uh, systems have that kind of, of, of defect rate. The modern aircraft, though, have about a, a million, 100 million lines of software. So if we were to apply our space shuttle defect rates, our modern aircraft would have about 250 or 240 some defects. And we know that we're not achieving those, those software defect rates that the space shuttle is. And by, by uh, the way, that space shuttle code cost about $1,000 a line, so uh, a line of code. So if our, that trip from LA to Vegas to blow all your money over the weekend wouldn't cost $99, it would be about $99,000 if we were to, to have all of our software uh, to that level. But the process is very mature. S uh, air transportation is among the safest uh, ways, uh, modes of transportation today. So obviously something is working. Uh, when, what do we mean when we talk about security, though? Security is generally uh, discussed in two flavors. Uh, we've heard of quite a bit of it over the last couple of days, either cybersecurity or anti-tamper. Anti-tamper generally does have classification associated with it. So we're going to not going to talk about that, uh, that a lot in, in today's presentation. We're kind of focusing on cyber. And cyber is generally protecting a, an asset from, uh, from, from being attacked, losing its availability, or the data involved in it. And in most of our avionic systems or safety critical systems, we're talking about having that system function, function appropriately. Security does have guidelines. They're not generally hard requirements. They're guidelines, so they aren't hard, fast rules that you have to, have to follow as opposed to safety. But there are generally some good guidelines and, and best practices involved in safety. And the common method to, uh, 
uh, to protect our, our systems is to really limit the entry points into our systems or reduce them to, to zero by completely isolating the systems. One of the problems, though, with security is there is an awful lot of, uh, of FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt, a, a lot of hype. Has anyone seen this gentleman here before? This is, this is the guy that, dis, that claims to have broken into the uh, thrust management system of an aircraft via the in-flight entertainment systems. So I've met with many of the people who designed those systems. Those are physically not connected to the system. So it's very unlikely that this guy actually did anything other than probably disrupted a movie, which could be a safety critical event. If you're on a cross-country flight without access to those movies, you could commandeer and take over that flight and it could go down. So I do get what he's saying. There is a danger there, but the danger is not what he actually claims to, uh, to have done. Now, um, we can also be pretty confident that not only today, but in the future, aircraft designers and nuclear power plant designers are not going to connect the guest Wi-Fi services to the main critical systems in, there, in that system. So we can rest a little bit assured that that's probably not going to happen as easily as this guy, this guy says. But that doesn't mean there are not vulnerabilities into this system, and we do need to uh, work hard to, to thwart those threats. I love that word, thwart. You, you don't get to use it very often. So one of the key things, though, is that the ecosystem is becoming more increasingly connected. Uh, the systems for planes, trains, and automobiles are connected. And thanks to uh, our friend Rich over here, he's now connecting, all, or the connectors are now connected. So now another area that we all have to worry about. But this whole IoT revolution has brought along a, uh, a whole set of smart devices. Everything is smart now. That means everything's connected. It saves a great deal of money. We get uh, more information. With the maintenance is, is, uh, is much easily and much more cost effective. But this comes at a cost. We're coming more and more connected, more reliant on those connected. In the last three years, for example, there have been over 150,000 documented cases of GPS um, uh, interference or, or jamming. And those are the only ones that are documented. So uh, one of the interesting things that Pokemon Go game encouraged hackers to actually spoof GPS signals. Now, they were trying to do it on a cell phone, but the algorithms that they were um, uh, displaying or, or sharing with everybody could easily be adapted for other nefarious means. And the big point is hackers only have to be right one time, whereas the system designers, they have to be right all the time. So where are safety and security, uh, where are they similar? Well, both really benefit from requirements-based dri or driven processes uh, and really benefit from very specific monitoring of critical functions or interface. Now, you've heard it here first. I am proposing a new type of monitoring. I call it spousal monitoring after my wife, who monitors my cell phone, my email, and all the things, and she does it rigorously. So I want to impose monitoring equivalent to what my wife is able to do, and able to do that um, uh, quickly, easily, uh, and consistently across all, all the important interfaces that I might have. Uh, monitoring is something that is extremely difficult to do. Uh, for an example, uh, one of the things that Mercury has, has developed a, uh, a competency in is monitoring the output of a graphics channel. Now, it's pretty easy to monitor what goes into a graphics pipeline. Say I want a, the aircraft to uh, or display to the pilot a heading of 010. It's pretty easy to tell. I've told the pilot or the graphics pipeline to display 010, but at the end of a gra uh, the graphics pipeline, I don't have 010. I have a picture of 010. I don't know what that's supposed to look like. How do I check it? So it's quite difficult in some of these interfaces to actually monitor what is correct, not necessarily for anything that's erroneous, but what if, it's, if the uh, display is stuck? What if the display is no longer displaying the, the correct information? And how do I even know that? And how do I let the, uh, the pilots know that that information that they have is stale, is no longer correct? So it's very difficult to do. Uh, the big thing, though, is that hackers generally take advantage of, of defects. And we talked about the, the, the quality in our software. We know that in a, in a modern aircraft, there are literally hundreds of defects that, that we may or may not know about that. So this is where hackers take, uh, take advantage of these defects. This is also where the mishaps actually happen as well. 
and, and the interfaces between different systems. You're talking about inf interfaces between this, the uh, operating systems, the middleware, the uh, applications that the customers are, are, uh, are writing themselves. They're all upgraded at different rates. So there's great uh, uh, um, possibility for potential defects that, are, that are, uh, arise from that. We greatly try to reduce the, uh, the attack surfaces. By that means we try to simplify the designs. Now, when I first came to Mercury, I was uh, shown something that was actually very striking, and that was a block diagram, which all of our hardware guys like to create, well, you know, a whole bunch of boxes with a whole bunch of lines in between them telling how complex this board is. And then I saw the first block diagram of one of our safety critical boards. The safety critical board actually looked like one of my kids wrote it with Korans. In so fact, I said, why are you using Visio? You can use a Crayola on that thing. It's so simple. A CPU aligned to memory. Wow, it's, it's, it's brilliant, right? But the great thing about that is they can prove that, uh, that it's correctness in that. So the, uh, the, the way they reduce attack vectors is to simplify those designs. And the way they actually uh, figure out what it is that they need to protect or is a lot of testing. They try to break it. And then whenever they're able to break it, they fix what they, what they break, keep it from happening again. But where are safety and security different? Well, the, the main thing is security is constantly evolving, always evolving. Um, anyone have any idea roughly how many pieces of malware, viruses, or, or malicious code are detected each year? It's, it's well over 300 million. The last time I saw an, a really accurate number uh, was about 317 million, uh, million instances of malicious code each year. So our, our, our guys that are trying to hack us are, are pretty busy. So obviously we have to, can't wait multiple years. Like we saw several diagrams showing that uh, a 40 year life cycle of an aircraft, we cannot keep that, that security posture the, the same. But safety is very static, very costly to update. So in general, we do not want to update those, those interfaces, those systems, unless we absolutely have to. So the big difference in, in, the, uh, in their safety is one, the, uh, the update rate. The other is what happens if we do get an event. In a safety critical event, something that's the pilots relying on or an operator of a, of a nuclear power plant or whatever, if they're relying on, on some sort of system to keep that, that system from safe and there's a compromise or an event, we can't just disable it and hope everything goes, goes, uh, goes on well. Whereas in the security world, if we do get an event, if we do get a compromise, it is a normal uh, action to, to disable that event and bring that, that mission back. The other thing is the testing environments for... Uh, for the two are very different. Safety, again, we, talk, we look at going from the high-level requirements to the low-level requirements to the, to the codes or the circuitry, and we're trying to test that we verify that the functionality between those high-level or low-level requirements meets the actual uh, specification of the, of the inter interfaces or the, or the code, and we're able to do that quite easily. Security testing, on the other hand, is very different. You've all heard of penetration tests where we, we hire a bunch of people who dress in tie-dye shirts. We amp them up with uh, Mountain Dew, and we try to get them to break the systems, and they, break, they work on them until they try to find an interface that they can get into. So those two types of uh, people are very different. They don't work in the same, uh, the same manners. They don't have the same language. They don't have the same tools. So the, the, the testing is obviously a very, very different, uh, different methodology. So with all that being said, where do we start? We have to do something. We want to do something. Where do we start? Well, it's clear that this, the safety certification authorities are going to want with a start with a foundation of safety. So it's probably going to be more cost effective to start with safety, add security to it, than start with, with security and add safety onto it. Um, the other thing is uh, there is not really a whole lot of systems that are proven to be secure anyway. So let's start with something that is, has proven to be, to be safe. Really good idea to start with a, a foundation of security, though. Trusted boot, we've heard a lot about that over the last couple of days. Uh, boot in a, in a trusted environment, load some signed images, and then sign to get out of the way and let the safety system take over, but we continue to monitor those, those uh, safety interfaces or the security interfaces as well. Um, ideally, though, we want to start at the system level. 
Um, what happens in reality, though, is that security is generally added as an afterthought and bolted onto a system. Mercury has been do doing security at the, at the grassroots level for many years, and so this is what we're trying to do now is bring that same functionality, that same uh, thinking into the safety world where we're adding that, that security in from the, from the onset. Now, this is a diagram of the ARP 4761 process. Now, ARP stands for Aerospace Recommended Practices. They aren't very recommended, as you can imagine. They're, they're kind of enforced. And when you hear a lot about uh, DO-254 and DO-178, notice that those, those standards actually don't apply until much later in the process. And so what Mercury is looking at doing is taking the security failures, the failure modes, the security monitoring of where we, we need to implement security and putting it much earlier in the process, much earlier than DO-178, DO-254, adding that upstream into the, the, the aircraft design stage, and we're starting to, to make requirements based on, on uh, the failure modes that are potential and the threat vectors that are realistically potential in that specific aircraft. Air, every aircraft, every power plant, every auto, is different, so you can't do a one-size-fits-all list of security features that'll that'll apply. But every system is uh, for is analyzed for safety in this manner, very individualistic. We can also start adding security requirements into into the uh, the same area, and that's where we're focusing our efforts. So. Again, given the increase, increase in connectivity, our safety systems are becoming more and more vulnerable. Um, we do need to start adding safety and security features more up front. Uh, we only need to protect against realistic threat vectors. We can't boil the ocean and try to implement every potential safety or security feature into a safety environment. It's just way too costly. And we must get the safety and security engineers working together talking the same language, and actually driving for a cost and reasonable, a reasonably cost-effective solution. Thank you.